MPP caucus in Parliament are using another route of having Parliament convene so that they can continue with government business. You know, they have argued before the court that um, the reason for which they wanted Parliament to come back was for them to be able to execute government business. Mm -hmm. And that's if, um, <coughs> sorry, if the MPs whose seats were declared vacant were uh, not allowed to be recognized as MPs to frustrate government business and all that. That's right. So we know the background story. Now, basically, the MPs are saying that the MPP caucus in Parliament is saying that when you look at Article 1123 of the 1992 Constitution, as well as um, Order 53 of their own standing orders, there is an opening there that allows for MPs to impress on the, upon the Speaker to reconvene Parliament or to summon Parliament, if you like. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that provision, it says that notwithstanding any other provision of this article, now mind you, the, the provisions that come before this basically talks about when Parliament should sit in its regular sitting. Mm -hmm. So the exception made here is that notwithstanding any other provision of this article, 15% of members of Parliament may request a meeting of Parliament and the Speaker shall, within seven days after the receipt of the request, summon Parliament. This is the same provision that has been provided for in their standing orders. Right. So there's no need for us to belabor that point. So, so they you, did that just 15% of yes. 271 or 275, 75, depending, depending on, on which side of the pendulum exactly. you want to swing. Uh, and so then if they pass that test, then within seven days, the Speaker would have to summon Parliament. So Remember, this will not be the first time they are doing this. Mm -hmm. When they were on recess, not quite long, so they had to, 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 mm -hmm. to use this same route to have Parliament sit on some matters that the, the majority then said were agent matters. Absolutely. So it's, it's basically the same thing that they are doing. So we did the maths, right? The 15%? Yes. We did a 15% uh, calculation uh, for that. 275. Yes, so when you're looking at 15% of 275, you'd have, we are looking at 42 MPs. Okay. But looking at the memo and then the accompanying attachment with it, mm -hmm. we noticed that well over 80 MPs signed that particular um, document to the yeah, effect that, that, that they, the memo, right? Yes. O over, over 80 signatories. Signatories, yes. So, so to the effect that they wanted the speaker to um, summon parliament. Then again, you would notice that the memo is dated 22nd October. That's yeah. yesterday. That's true. But the provision says that upon receipt, we mm -hmm. are not too sure whether the speaker's office has received this memo. Mm. But granted that it was received yesterday, if you are to calculate for seven days, you are looking at between yesterday and then the 31st of October mm -hmm. for the speaker to take that particular action. So when you look at your calendar, you can take out the, the weekends. You have basically from 22nd of October to 31st. Within these days, mm -hmm. the speaker, if he has received this memo in question, then he would have to summon parliament for them to... So seven days upon receipt. Yes. And, and obviously, we, we're not in position to, to also say whether the speaker's office has... Yes, but we're so just you, using we're the dates the on the memo, which is 22nd. 22nd. Yes, which uh, 22nd was yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. So if it was received yesterday, then it would mean that latest by um, 31st of October this month... Perfect. Um, ...parliament should be back in there. And they make the case for why they want this call to be made mm -hmm. or why it is necessary for parliament to reconvene. These are the things that they say they want to attend to. A request for tax exemptions for designated beneficiaries under the One District, One Factory program, Ghana Financial Stability Fund, an international development association facility of 250 million United States dollars. They also want to attend to some bills and these bills include Environmental Protection Agency Bill 2024, Social Protection Bill 2023, Customs Amendment Bill 2024, Budget Bill 2023, Ghana Boundary Commission Bill 2023, and the Interstate Succession Bill 2022. So these are the matters the MPP are the caucus, matters. yes, in Parliament right. consider agent for which reason they want the Speaker to summon the House um, within the next seven days upon receipt of their memo. Perfect. Now, the fundamental question here is, if the Speaker indeed does heed to this, and recalls Parliament for this emergency sitting for these agent matters. The f issue is who is the majority? That question has still not been answered, right? Yes. And if Parliament is recalled, who is going to assume that majority position will still be a contentious matter that will disrupt or possibly disrupt the, the recall of Parliament again. But Alfred, right? remember yesterday before they had to consider whether 
the MPP caucus should be a part of the city or not, there was a meeting of leadership of mm -hmm. some sort before. Now, considering that there are some seven days within which the speaker would make this call, the expectation is that within those seven days, there could be some intervention, there could be some meetings, some concessions could be made, and possibly by the time this call is made and they reconvene, it will not be as we saw yesterday. We'll see how the coming days will look like within these seven days. And, and this is where, uh, let's hear from the NPP caucus, the second deputy whip for the NPP caucus in this eighth parliament, the Honorable Alex Tete. John Obua, I spoke to him earlier on 3FM, hot edition. And here, in fact, together with other MPs, he led this whole process of getting the memo to the Speaker of Parliament together with over 80 members of Parliament belonging to the NPP side. Take a listen. You're seeking to have Parliament record with the details of this memo uh, that we have. I mean, you witnessed what happened in Parliament yesterday, correct? You were there. As you can recall, Parliament was called last week for our sitting, and on the same day, the minority leader raised an issue about uh, four MPs who have declared their intention to contest the upcoming election as independent candidate and one, I mean, closing to the MPP. And based on that, the Speaker of Parliament actually announced the seat as a vacant. Upon that announcement, the able majority leader, Alessa Fionn Markin, sent a case to court for the Supreme Court to actually do the interpretation of the law. And yesterday, we came to Parliament to do our usual sitting. On reach chamber, what is actually happened there is that we, the majority side, went in through our chief whip. We sat at where our sister, NEC, came and took over the area. As a law abandoned citizen or members of parliament, we yet to them in order not to create tension in the chamber through our leader, Alexa Fignon Marke. When the speaker finally came to the chamber, he announced that he has received an order from the Supreme Court. And based on that, he is going to make a statement. And upon hearing his statement, there is a need for us to recall Parliament. Uh, well, the NDC and Peace make the point quite strongly that you know you had urgent government business as the MPP caucus. Yet yesterday, you vacated the chamber into your offices which then left the Speaker with no option than to adjourn Parliament indefinitely. Why then trigger an emergency recall? I would have loved if you can ask NDC people if they actually believe in the Supreme Court. Because if the Supreme Court has given an order that the Speaker should allow the four members of Parliament to do their usual business in Parliament. And as the members of Parliament, we have our sitting arrangement. The right side of the speaker is the majority, and the left side of the speaker is the minority. We went and sat out of where we belong to. The NDC came with their numbers and other things to took over the priest. And some of their members are pulling the leaders that we should, I mean, get up from the priest. And we don't want to create a situation. So our leader, Alessa Fignon Magu, who believes in the law, and as equally, we also believe that we should actually wait for the speaker to come and make an announcement whether. What the Supreme Court has said is what we are going to follow. Speaker King, and he said, based on the order from the Supreme Court and the tension in the House, he's adjourning the House in Italy. So that's uh, the Honorable Alex, that, uh, John Oboa, who is the second deputy whip of the NPP caucus in this eighth parliament. But he, he asked a question of the NPP, that's the NDC MPs, a question to them as to whether... Uh, th this is one that they're going to be aligned with. Al Hassan Suini is Tamale North Member of Parliament. He's joining us on the telephone. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, you've heard uh, the second deputy whip of the of the majority, well, the NPP caucus in this parliament makes the point that in fact he led a number of his colleagues to send a memo to the Speaker of Parliament to trigger an emergency recall after yesterday's indefinite adjournment by the speaker. How does this strike you? Mm. 
unfortunate. We, 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 we lost him on the telephone. We'll try to raise him back on the telephone to have a quick conversation with him on this. But we're still live here on Ghana tonight. So uh, connecting with Al Hassan Suwini shortly to have a quick conversation on this matter and other issues coming up. But while we are at it, coming up next, we're going to get to him shortly on this. But coming up next here on Ghana tonight, there are some members of the NDC caucus who are leading the process for the repeal of the law that permits mining in forest reserves. We have the details including the fears of the Ghana coalition against illegal mining um, who have also uh, been talking and also making the point right now about how the current state of affairs in this eighth parliament is going to impact on them. And well, these are the proponents the proponents that of this, this, this three MPs, NDC MPs from the NDC caucus in Parliament, uh, sponsoring a private member's bill seeking to repeal parts of the law that allows mining in forest reserves. The MPs, as you see there, Al Hassan Suini is going to be joining us in a bit. Uh, Samuel Okujatoa Blakwa, Member of Parliament for the North Tongue constituency. Uh, Francis Xavier Kojososu, Member of Parliament for the Medina constituency. And this private member's motion uh, will, will tell you in a bit exactly what they intend to achieve with that and the objectives as we have it right now. But as we do know, th there are clear indications of what they intend to do going forward and exactly what the demands are in this private member's motion uh, and what they are asking for with the parliament and also what the demands are in this particular one we'll get into it shortly here on hot edition on uh, as Elia indicated what the ND, the NPP MP also stated uh, on radio will tell you exactly about it and these are the main reasons they said want to repeal the provision that grants the president authority to issue mining licenses and uh, the leases in forest reserves in order to protect the environment and uphold Ghana's commitment to sustainable development and conservation of biodiversity and that's why they are going on this private members motion will tell you parts of this li2462 which is of a real problem um, to them uh, and and why they are going on this path and making demands of of parliament and we'll get to them shortly to have a quick conversation on this and um, engineer dr ken ashigbe um, who is going to be joining us in a bit as well to have a quick conversation on this matter and also hear from him and why they make the strong claim that this is one that uh, indeed must have the attention of the Speaker of Parliament, Engineer Dr. Kenashi. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First off, with this promise by the president, which indeed got the organized labor to call off the intended strike, that LI2462 is going to be repealed. Well, that law is still on our books as we speak. And parliament is on indefinite adjournment. Certainly this must come out of consent to you, is it not? It, it, it is really worrying. And um, one of the things that we thought was going to happen Immediately, uh, Parliament came in on the 15th. Was an action that was going to be taken to immediately repeal the LI 2462 so that it did not need the 21 days to mature. But it doesn't look like that has happened. And now we have the situation where the Speaker of Parliament has... Um, suspended the house synodine. So it's really a worrying thing. Uh, one of the things I would hope that would happen immediately is for the fact that the, the attorney general has written for the revocation, the minister for environment would ensure that every action on this that particular ally is suspended. And it is the reason why we also are asking for um, the revocation of all leases and permits that have been granted under 
this particular ally. If the spirit is the fact that we believe there's a bad law, we're repealing it, then the executive should take action. The president can issue an EI that revokes all of those uh, permits as well. And it's important to also serve notice to the EPA, for example, that if the uh, Minerals Commission has issued any permits under this very bad law, they, the EPA, will not go ahead and sign any of these permits. So that's also very important. It is one of the things that has to be done. And so we hope that Parliament would also look at all of this and address these their issues, you know, as quickly as possible and make sure that we can come back into Parliament and get some work happening. Uh, there are several challenges that are confronting us as a country, and we should be able to solve this problem that currently confronts them and so that we can go ahead with uh, the issues of uh, that confront this country. And it's important to also note that as we're speaking, we are not too sure about what is happening to the military exercise that is going on. Mm. There's very little information that, that we're getting to the extent that it had to take a damn to tell us that the brim that they had gone on, the Galamsias had returned uh, to the, the site again. And thank God the Small Scale Miners Association also got involved and some of these people have been arrested. It will be important to find out where those uh, people are. So urge TV3 uh, to find out what, that, what had happened to that case. And then very disturbing was this attack uh, of, of uh, these small scale miners who don't have a, a lease, uh, were engaged in an illegality that was being filmed by a colleague, Erastus that and his other colleagues that were being attacked. It is great that the IGP had gotten involved and now we understand that three people have been arrested. It is important for the IGP himself to also investigate that if any of his policemen, you know, did not behave appropriately, they, they, they are also sanctioned. But it is important that beyond the three people who are arrested, the directors of the company and the owners of the company that have the leads that are engaged in that illegality are brought to book and we throw the book at them. This is the reason why the call for the state of emergency is still an important one. And we would ask the government still considers that. And we should not be detracted by this issues that are happening in parliament. Right. The general side, the echo side is continuing and we need to take all actions to ensure that we deal with it. And quite comprehensive. I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Engineer Dr. Ken Ashikbe leads the Ghana Coalition Against Illegal Mining, um, joining us on this one. And let's stay a bit further on this. And the Honorable Al Hassan Suhini is a Tamale North Member of Parliament. He's one of three NDC MPs who are sponsoring this private member's bill to have this LI-2462 that allows mining in our forest reserves to be repealed. He's joining us on the telephone right now. Good evening, Honorable. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Alfred. Thank you very much for having me, and good evening to so, our so, listeners. Great. Right. Now, first of all, we, we've got the details of this private member's bill that you, together with uh, the Honorable uh, Francis Xavier Sosu and also Samuel Okuja Tuablakwa, are sponsoring. What path is this going to take, considering that Parliament is on recess indefinitely? Well, um, yes, what we are seeking to do is to begin the process of repeal, repealing uh, Section 32 of LI-2462. And this has become necessary because we are not very convinced about this government's commitment to repeal that law, despite repeated calls on them to do so, and, uh, you know, some assurance also from them to do so. Parliament resumed uh, some couple of uh, days ago, and uh, we have not seen anything that suggests to us that they are treating the need to repeal this law with any seriousness or any agency. And look, Alfred, we are, you know, an existential threat. If you look at 
the number of licenses this government has issued in the last eight years, over 1,600, it tells you that if the trend is allowed to continue, especially with this law still on our books, the president and his government may just hustle and sell our, for our forest reserves to, you know, very reckless miners like they are doing in the case of the small-scale mining and the licenses that they are issuing. And so we are just beginning the process. We have filed the necessary, you know, uh, uh, amendment uh, to the, you know, offices in Parliament that are tasked to help in the process of uh, working on a private member's bill. And we will... Hope that it will be in the way until such a time that Parliament is able to sit and consider it. And it shouldn't take uh, uh, much of a time for it to be repealed. And so we just want to call the T's and dot the I's and uh, then wait for when Parliament resumes uh, for us to consider it and take it through the motions that it is uh, supposed to go through to have Section 3 to of uh, LI246 to uh, repeal. Look, the calls have been, you know, very loud from civil society organizations and from all, uh, Ghanaians from all walks of life, very well-meaning Ghanaians. And we thought that this government would have treated it with the seriousness that it deserves when Parliament resumes. But we are not seeing any agency. And as people responsible and also committed to you know, protecting our environment and saving what is left of it. We think that we cannot afford to do nothing. And that is why we have taken this step. Myself, ranking member of the Lands and Natural Resources Committee, my very good friend and brother, Samuel Okujeto Ablak, our North Tongue MP, who is the chairman of the Assurance Committee. You recall that only a couple of weeks ago, he had called to even bring agencies that are responsible for ensuring that we sanitize the system to appear before his committee to answer questions. And we also have our uh, brother, uh, Francis Xavier Sosu, who is a member of the subsidiary legislation committee, who is helping us in the uh, drafting of this uh, private member's bill, uh, being part of it. Because we cannot afford to do nothing. If we are unable uh, so far to save the environment that is currently experiencing a gang rape as a result of the indiscriminate licenses that have been issued to uh, small-scale miners who, in most cases, are engaged in reckless mining. At least, we need to do something to preserve the what is left of our forest reserves. We do know that about 30 of our forest reserves, we are told, are no longer in existence. Right. So we need to do something to end the fight and well, then wait for a time when a government that is more committed to the fight against this illegal mining uh, will, will take over. And I'm sure it will be soon, inshallah. And, and right. And, and Elia, what I was trying to get you into is that call by your colleagues on the other side. In fact, uh, we had Elia from Alex Tete Jonoboa, who is a second deputy whip for the MPP caucus, um, who together with over 80 MPP MPs, have sent a memo to the Speaker to have Parliament recalled to consider what they have termed agent government business for this emergency record just 24 hours after that uh, indefinite adjournment by the Speaker. How does that strike you? I say it is ridiculous. And How is that? I mean, what has changed from yesterday till today? What has changed? The status in Parliament remain unchanged. The situations, the prevailing circumstances that led to the Speaker's decision to suspend the House indefinitely still persist. So, on what basis are they seeking to get the Speaker to recall the House next week? On what basis? Because, you see, they need to understand, and I think that people in government especially, and the larger New Patriotic Party needs to call their leadership in Parliament to order. 
they are putting their interest to be leaders in Parliament over the very important, you know, business of running the country. Government business is at a standstill because these leaders of the party in Parliament consider their majority status to be more important than, you know, providing a platform for government business to be transacted on the floor of Parliament. Why do I say so? There is nowhere in our standing order, there's nowhere in the Constitution where it is said that a governing party necessarily has to form majority in Parliament. The framers of the Constitution and the framers of our standing orders anticipated a situation where the governing party will not control Parliament, will not have majority in Parliament. And that is why in our standing orders, the majority leader is defined as the person who leads the party with the highest number of seats. It didn't say the majority leader is the one who leads the governing party in parliament. And so government business can still be transacted. We, on the NDC side, have always pledged our commitment to help our colleagues in the NPP who are currently in government to transact government business. As far as that business will not affect the generality of Ghanaians. And we have done that in the past. And we are still willing to help them transact government business. But who says they have to do that by being majority? Willingly, when they are not. Arithmetically and logically, they are not the majority in parliament today. So why do they sacrifice government business to prove a point that is needless? So, 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 so your point is that for as long as that matter remains, that there's contention about who is majority, if Parliament is recalled for this urgent business or emergency sitting, that matter will still come up and it, it, it would not have Parliament sit until it is settled. Exactly so. I mean, that's why I'm saying it is ridiculous, it is foolhardy for anybody to contemplate calling Parliament back without addressing the prevailing issues, the issues that led to the indefinite suspension in the first place. Because... It is not going to be wished away. I mean, we are not going to abdicate. We are going to defend our, you know, newly acquired status as a majority. We are not going to abandon our, you know, insistence that we are the majority in parliament. And so if they are recalling, if they are asking the speaker to recall parliament, is it the case? that they are now going to embrace their status as a minority and sit on the left-hand side of the speaker. If that is what they intend to do, then, in my view, that would have been reasonable because then we can be the majority as we are and, and sit where we are supposed to sit and help them transact government business. I see. Nothing stops government business from being run on the floor of parliament because the governing party is the minority. Uh, well, and I want to hold on a bit for me because I, I want you to respond to something briefly. For the MPP, with all of this that's happening in Parliament, with, with the confusion that we have seen and all, it is part of you, the NDC, a grand plan that you have to win this 2024 election by disrupting the business of Parliament. And in fact, they say they've intercepted a document that it's titled Winning the 2024 Elections and Beyond, a Comprehensive NDC Strategy. He said that, that's all of this. And I want to take a listen to Richard Anhia, who is the Director of Communications of the MPP, who addressed the press conference earlier today, making that claim. Take a look. Moving on to the NDC's document to win uh, the election 2024, which I've just shown you, our verification shows it's not a fake document. It's a true document, a document the NDC has been working with. The document consists of 11 chapters, each directing the NDC on various disruptive, unfair, and outright crude tactics. It has a central objective, which is for the NDC to obtain power by every means necessary. Fair, 
or foul, but primarily through foul means. From what we have read in the document, the NDC had a plan right from January 8, 2021 to frustrate the government and make it unpopular through foul means to win power December 7, 2024. This document we have uncovered from the NDC promotes crude, undemocratic, and unpatriotic means of achieving political power. So, Honorable Sweeney, that's Richard Ahiyagba there. This is an 11 chapter document. We haven't seen it, but he, they, this, he says the MPP has verified it and it is going according to plan. Is this what's happening? You know, it's as fake. That document that they made your friend to is as fake as they come, as they themselves are. I mean, this government or this party, you have to give it to them. Their propaganda prowess seems limitless sometimes. Remember, they have been at faith. They have been doing everything possible to find equalization for their very evil document, the Japadia document. And they have tried to spin it in so many ways. The Japadia document that people started paying attention to only when they started seeing the implementation was referred to as a document that the NDC masterfully prepared. How could the NDC know what they intended to do and be so exact in the way that, you know, the, the, the plot was played out in that document? So when that lie didn't stay, the attempt to suggest that the NDC prepared the Japanese document didn't stay, I'm not surprised that they are at this, you know, a trick again, pulling up a document so-called prepared by the NDC on how to win the 2024 general election. All right, the NDC will win the 2024 general elections, inshallah, based on our superior policy position, based on our superior past record, and not based on strategy, as they claim. Okay. They are on record to have said that they intend to win this election based on strategy. Because oh. clearly, even in their hearts, they know that they cannot win this election based on their performance, based okay. on their track record. They can't win this election based on how well they have performed when it comes to the management of the economy. They can't win based on how they have managed the environment. Okay. They cannot win based on how they have fought corruption. So they are going to win based on strategy. And part of that strategy may just be throwing out this fake document and denying the obvious. And the obvious is that their performance in government has been as abysmal. And the NDC doesn't need to create I'll, any document with an agenda to, 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 to win the 2020 I'll, I'll ask apart from our manifesto. Well, uh, we have 45 days to Election Day, December 7th. Thank you for joining us here on your Election Command Center. Lars Ansoni is Member of Parliament for the Tamale North constituency, um, uh, talking to us there on a number of issues. But coming up next on Ghana Tonight, there are calls heightening for the review of the procurement laws of this country. We find out how and why, as we hear from the former Auditor General, Daniel Yao Demenovo. He's been speaking about the current status and the state of this procurement law and matters arising. Stay with us. We're back shortly after this quick break. Oh, welcome back. Uh, former Auditor General Daniel Yao de Melovo is calling for a review of the Procurement Act. Now, he argues the law in its current form has loopholes that needs to be indeed uh, filled to ensure that we're able to get this matter dealt with. But if you look at the Auditor General's report over the period, at least over the last five years, you see the reason why the call that he's making certainly needs some attention. In 2019, over 37.3 million Ghana cities was lost to procurement breaches within public boards, corporations, and other statutory institutions. In 2020, during COVID, take a look at that, over 846.1 
million Ghana cities was lost to procurement breaches. Think about it. During COVID, in 2021, over 306.7 million cities was lost through procurement breaches, essentially corruption in the procurement process. 2022, 42.7 million in excess of that. And in 2023, this last year, over 53.7 million cities lost to procurement breaches, procurement corruption in this country. That's why Daniel Yadamilavo wants something to be done about this. He spoke earlier today. Take a look. Sentiments that you have expressed uh, on issues of public procurement. And I was laughing to say that when you see some people say they are going to abolish single source uh, procurement. And I said, even the competitive tender rate, it is fixed. <laughs> Before they even start the process, they know who is going to be. So if they are all scams. They are all methods of procurement which can be scammed. So we as a people may have to start first by having a critical look at the law. I cannot agree more with you on the law. The law itself creates a problem for public procurement, and I've said this on several occasions. That if the attorney general who is supposed to prosecute us is seated over there and he gives an advice and allow a bad procurement request to go through, is he going to prosecute when the time comes? Mind you, no less a person than the deputy attorney general sits on the procurement board representing the attorney general. Odame, before he became attorney general, was the one there. Now one of his deputies is there. And once attorney general gives opinion or position, it is taken, more or less. And if in case it becomes scandalous, as we have seen some of them, what do you think will happen? Then look at the people who select the rest of the members. <laughs> Minister of Finance, who does most of the procurement, and you go there for the exemption, and these are his people sitting there. So it will go through. No wonder at times when the single source procurement is approved, you and I, we are surprised. That even notwithstanding, I've also drawn attention, which I'll draw to today, that everyone should read the Public Procurement Act Section 40 carefully. At times, the board does not even have the mandate to give approval, but they give. Because the law does not just give them a mandate to approve, it gives them the conditions under which they can approve. And those conditions do not accrue before they do the approval. So there are several issues that I think uh, we can address. I would not like to become the center of the report. Well, Daniel Yardemel over there, he knows this quite clearly. Adam Sedano is a co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. Sedano, you heard him, uh, Daniel Yardemel over there, quite clear on the loopholes and why this cannot continue. Your take on this? Yes, to some extent. Um, we have seen the consistent use, for example, of single source procurement. Even though the law is very clear on the conditions under which this can be done, yet people have ignored uh, and still use that, ending up with uh, procurement that is far more expensive than it ought to be, at the expense of you know uh, the the the, the coffers and what is available for other things to be done. Uh, so that's been a major gap. Um, we've had the issues of poor supervision and monitoring. Uh, so uh, we've had services that are supposed to have been paid for and yet not provided uh, items outstanding. The Auditor General's report has been, been replete with several of such examples. So clearly something is not working whether it's the law itself, whether it's the enforcement aspects of it, whether it's a sanction, whether it is who is responsible to supervise, clearly we need to try and drill down some more. Uh, in my view, clearly enforcement is one of the right. elements. Uh, and again, supervision, monitoring and supervision. And, and, and so on that uh, point, uh, Mr. Anna, Anna, that point about monitoring and supervision, Daniel Domelovo talks about the competitive bidding 
being the solution or competitive tendering being the solution to this. And he says that even with the competitive tendering, <laughs> most cases, they know the winner of the competitive process even before the process ends. So <laughs> it's not a foolproof solution to this, is it not? And yes, based on um, information that I've gathered engaging with people uh, in the public sector, uh, yes, you have situations where uh, bids that were submitted, uh, people uh, can pick the names of these companies and their documents and, and try and use that to, you know, uh, create the sense of, you know, when we say you have a minimum of, let's say, three bits, uh, they find ways and means of using old data. Uh, and unless somebody is checking before you know it, it means that they already know, they, they, they kind of create the scenario such that there is one out of the lot that is going to win anyway. Uh, I guess that's the kind of scenario where we had with ABAJ's situation, where uh, the contracts for sale thing, you know, where they kind of cook things. And before you know it, one particular person or one particular entity is the one that is, is set up to win. Right. Uh, we've got to look at the information that is available and think through it and right. see how do we strengthen our systems to prevent that. Such that those with the competencies, those what, with credibility, those who be, can give us value for money uh, what, in terms of their institutional... Um, reputation and, and, and experience are the ones who win and therefore Ghana gets the best results out of these tendering processes. Rightly so. Uh, Masano, appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it is co-founder of the Citizen Movement Against Corruption. And I will settle for the people's voices. Emmanuel Samani is joining me with the Ghanaian people who have a voice on the issues happening in, in Parliament and how things are played out right now. Samani, what are they telling you? Well, thank you very much, Alfred. Good evening and welcome to the People's Voice here on Ghana Tonight. And I am Emmanuel Samani. Tonight, we're on the streets to find out what we can do our, or the solutions, really, to the stillmates that we have in Parliament whilst both sides are saying that they are both the majority. So let's hit the streets and find out what can be the solutions. So let's start off here, boss. Um, into no Parliament's higher giddy giddy. So from your perspective, no, how can we solve the, the impasse in Parliament? Uh, problem is not too heavy because uh, NDC for the propaganda no more yet. Because who has a bit of majority of the Because any part no more Parliament did that. Yen two aba any woman sin ten ye no be catch away majority. Because one more parliament one more ho. And this ye be answer no uh mumba cast me a majority. I just say ya co a co to aba a ma e be a timem and to aba ma womu. And this yeah to aba ma womu dia and ya wo bet me a catch away majority now once I won't. So how can we solve it? I mean, I to be a speaker of parliament in order to come say and this for me a majority man in ye. Simple. Right. Right, let's get some more views here, Chief. Many thanks. Uh, so as you know, there's a stalemate in Parliament. Both sides are saying they are, they are the majority. And as a result of that impasse, uh, the Speaker has suspended parliamentary sittings indefinitely. How do you think we can solve this impasse? Well, uh, you see, in the first place, to me, I think uh, the Speaker had, because uh, you see, even though, yes, uh, the people have declared their intention to go for independent and on one independent coming to MPP, I believe the action has to be triggered by the party in which they are involved. Because I also believe that the, 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 the decision to go independent is for the ninth parliament, not the eighth parliament. So to, to deprive a constituency of its parliamentarian is, 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 is something that uh, uh, is not proper. So I believe uh, the, uh, the speaker has to go by the Supreme Court's ruling that he has to stay execution of uh, the decision that he's taking so that we we'll, we we'll wait for the Supreme Court to, to uh, 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 give the verdict. I think it's going to be on seven days or so, so that we'll know. But to me, the Speaker actually did not uh, 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 preside over this issue very well because, you see, if you do things like that, it will bring chaos and anarchy. So the only solution to me...
Uh, well, so let the conversation continue. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. I'm Alfred Kansi. Do have a good night.